flood recovery or without. Either way, the idea is to put the CO2 underground and to have it stay there. And it needs to stay there for time scales that are relevant to the climate system. So it's not an arbitrary time scale. It's a time scale dictated by the climate system. All right. Well, what about the number of wedges? My best guess in terms of the current number of uh, coal-fired power plants worldwide is something in the low 2000s. So if we could somehow retrofit all of those plants, remember you need 800 to get one wedge. Okay, if you could retrofit all the plants, you immediately get several wedges out of this. So it becomes uh, clear that this is a sort of interesting thing to talk about. The build rate in China over the last several years has been one to two new, new coal-fired power plants per week. And if you take that rate and project it over any reasonable time scale, you can, you can come up with uh, one or more wedges uh, out of that if we were to build new plants differently, which of course is easier than retrofitting old plants. Anyway, the bottom line is that uh, if we were to do a, a, a full-out implement implementation of CCS, we could certainly get several wedges out of this activity, and therefore it's something that is, uh, is of broad interest, in fact. And if you look at almost all projections going out in terms of what the energy mix will look like in a carbon-constrained world, CCS comes online at some point over the next several decades, and typically in a significant way. All right, so if that's true, then uh, the obvious thing is that uh, we need to make sure we understand what we're doing if we're going to put enormous quantities of CO2 back underground uh, in terms of uh, geological storage. So in that regard, uh, I'd like to think a little bit about what happens if we, if we simply take CO2 and put it into uh, a deep saline aquifer. I'll say something about uh, aquifers, which is that uh, if you look globally at the estimated capacity, storage capacity, there seems to be enough storage capacity to at least get us through a kind of 50 to 100 year time horizon. And in the storage capacity, saline aquifers have uh, more storage capacity and probably by far more storage capacity than coal seams or, or depleted oil and gas reservoirs. Uh, everyone, I think, uh, who works in this area agrees that if we do this on a large scale, we will be injecting into deep saline aquifers. Uh, so that's really been the focus of what we're, what, uh, we're doing. And for the purpose of, of this talk, that's all I'm going to talk about because it's easier to just focus on deep saline, saline aquifers. <laughs> all right. To start with, uh, let me take a look at the diagram I just put up here, which is this. Uh, you, I know you probably can't see it very easily in the back, but this is a phase diagram for CO2. This is temperature on this axis, pressure on this axis. And on this diagram, you will see identified the critical point here which occurs at about 31 degrees C and about 7.5 megapascal. Once you go beyond those uh, values of pressure and temperature, you're into a supercritical phase where basically the CO2 has relatively high density but maintains relatively low viscosity, if you want to think of it that way. All right? Almost everyone talks about injecting CO2 as a supercritical phase. And if you think about uh, or if you look at typical geothermal gradients and typical pressure gradients, CO2 will exceed the critical point, or the pressure and temperature will exceed the critical point, and CO2 will become supercritical uh, below a depth of about 800 meters. So most discussions will say, let's assume we inject below 800 meters, and the reason is that you want to get into this relatively dense phase of CO2. All right? So let's assume we're injecting a supercritical CO2 phase into a formation that is initially filled with salt water, right? a, a, a saline aquifer. What happens? Well, I've listed a couple of what I think are the uh, important attributes of the system here. First of all, supercritical CO2 is slightly miscible with the brine, up to a few percent, and probably uh, less than that when you take into account the composition of the brine, but nonetheless, a little bit of the CO2 can dissolve into the water that it encounters. That means that most of the CO2, at least over a significant time period, will remain as a separate phase. Therefore, we have a multi-phase flow problem, just like oil and water, but now it's CO2 and water. All right. <coughs> the CO2, even though it is relatively dense, will always be less dense than the brine by about a factor of two. This depends on pressure and temperature, obviously. But uh, the range uh, uh, is around uh, a factor of two. That is to say, the delta rho, the difference in density, is about 500 kilograms per cubic meter. For those of you who work in saltwater intrusion problems, you'll remember that the density difference, saltwater versus freshwater, is about 2.5%. 25 kilograms per cubic meter. This has a much stronger buoyant drive than saltwater uh, uh, intrusion problems. And we will use that fact to our advantage when we think about doing models. All right? uh, it's less viscous than the brine by one to two orders of magnitude. 
These two together say that we should expect a priori uh, the possibility of viscous instabilities. I'm injecting a less viscous fluid into a more viscous fluid. And certainly, we're going to get gravity override, where the less dense fluid will override the more dense fluid uh, when we do the injection. All right. And the last thing I mentioned in passing here, I won't get back to this, but you may want to remember this, is that uh, we're likely to, uh, to inject dry CO2 because dry CO2 is much less corrosive to pipes, for example, than wet CO2. So this will be CO2 without water vapor. But once the CO2, of course, is into the subsurface, um, it will contact water. Some of the water will evaporate into the CO2 phase, up to a few percent, and will create wet CO2, which is much more corrosive than the dry CO2. So we'll wind up with a corrosive kind of CO2 in the subsurface. All right. Well, that's basically what we've got. We've got a multi-phase flow system here in sort of the usual way, all right? But I have the last bullet on the bottom here to remind me to say a few other things about the system. First of all, when this little bit of CO2 dissolves into the aqueous phase, into the water phase, it will lower the pH in the water phase. And that can lead to a whole sequence of geochemical reactions between the aqueous phase and the rock, for example. So we may have to be thinking about geochemistry of various kinds when we think about this, this uh, particular problem. I've already said that uh, we, we will need to put away very large amounts of CO2. And that means we're going to want to put as much as possible underground. And that means we're going to want to inject at as high a pressure as possible, which means we may need to worry about geomechanics. So we may need to have to think about coupling geomechanics with geochemistry with multi-phase, multi-component flow. And the third thing I have listed here is that you know, I've got this phase diagram over here. If we get changes of, of uh, temperature and pressure, we can get phase changes. And these phase changes can lead to some strongly non-isothermal effects. For example, if, if, if CO2 changes rapidly, uh, depressurizes rapidly, you can get enormous changes in temperature. And those non-isothermal effects may be important. So now I may have to think about writing energy equations and thinking about enthalpies and all that sort of thing. All right, so, you know, and we can add in a few more in the dot, dot, dot here. So at this point, you know, I could uh, attempt, and I think probably successfully, to convince you that this is a really complicated system. You've got multiple components, multiple phases, geochemistry, uh, geomechanics, non-isothermal effects, et cetera, et cetera. And we could spend the rest of the talk writing a whole set of coupled nonlinear partial differential equations. Uh, and I could tell you that this is a really cool, complicated system to work with. In many ways, that's true. Uh, however, I'm not going to take that approach. Instead. We're going to take a different path, which uh, I will attempt to motivate in the next couple of slides. But ultimately, we're going to try to take a step back and say, all right, it's a complicated system, but how simple can we make this system and still get something useful out of it? OK, so we're going to take a slightly different approach than, oh, isn't this really fun? It's really complicated. Okay. So <clears throat> first of all, let's think about what happens if we do an injection. Well, uh, if, we, if we inject through a vertical well here, as illustrated, into a formation, some deep subsurface formation here, initially filled with brine. <coughs> uh, what, what will happen? Well, let's assume that this formation is permeable enough to accept a sufficient amount of CO2 to make it economically worthwhile. And let's assume that it's overlain by a formation that's sufficiently impermeable that it will stop the CO2 from rising up uh, by buoyancy out of this formation. All right. So we assume we've got a good permeable formation here and a good impermeable cap rock above it. <clears throat> if I do the injection, what's going to happen? Well, the CO2 is clearly going to be rising up by density. And I get this sort of gravity override characteristic here. And the extent of this uh, leading edge of the CO2 will be enhanced because I have uh, viscous instabilities in the system. OK, and that's pretty much the way the system works. Now, uh, this is shown very simply with a sort of invading front of CO2. Behind this front, I have a mix of brine and CO2. But if I'm injecting dry CO2, I will have a region back here where all the water has been evaporated and I have only dry CO2 that's left. And we typically denote the boundary between this region and the two-phase region by what we call a drying front. OK, so I can think of this as sort of a, an invading CO2 front being chased by a drying front, all of this pushing the brine outward uh, in some way. Now, what is there to say about the system? Well, we could say many things about it. but. If it's the case that this cap rock is aerially extensive and competent, meaning it's in good shape, and this formation is aerially extensive and sufficiently permeable, then uh, the CO2 will essentially stay in this formation for a very long time, long enough so that a significant amount of it can dissolve into the brine, 
long enough so that we don't have to worry about the CO2 getting back into the atmosphere, and we have essentially solved this particular piece of the climate problem. All right? So the idea is to keep the CO2 in this formation uh, so that we can deal with the climate problem, and as long as this cap rock does its job, we win the game. Okay? There are some other issues we'll think about as we go. For example, where's the brine go? And do we have to worry about that showing up somewhere where you don't want it? That's an interesting question which we'll get back to. But in any event, uh, that's pretty much what we expect. So if that's the case, if this is the system that you have, uh, you should chalk up a victory and then move on to something else. Okay, go to the next site because this is a great uh, circumstance. What might we need to worry about? Well, we know that these cap rock formations uh, may not be completely impermeable, right? So we may have sort of aerially diffuse leakage of either the CO2, shown in red, or the brine in blue. Should I worry about this? Well, um, at the moment, I, uh, I should say this. Up until a few months ago, my answer to that question was no. I don't find uh, a, a practical interest, and I didn't find it particularly scientifically interesting, just my own taste, and I just said, I'm not interested. And it turns out I was not quite right in that evaluation. Um, <coughs> And the reason is very interesting, uh, at least the reason I think uh, that we need to worry about it. And uh, let me just uh, explain it in a very short amount of time. First of all, the CO2 here, um, we can reasonably, you know, we, we could make an argument that, well, uh, this rock is going to be so tight and have such small uh, pore spaces that you get capillary entry exclusion here. So the two-phase, the, the interface properties will, will exclude the CO2 from invading. All right? Even if it does invade, uh, this CO2 leakage is probably not something we're going to worry very much about. The brine leakage, on the other hand, turns out to be interesting. Uh, and it turns out to be interesting because one of the points of discussion right now with EPA, for example, which has put out draft regulations for CCS, uh, is the identification of something called the area of review. If any of you does uh, injection of hazardous waste, you'll already know about uh, areas of review. <coughs> um, the area of review in this case won't simply be the area covered by the CO2 plume. This is a radial plot here, okay? This, is, this does not indicate the end of the area of review. <laughs> the area of review will be dictated by where you have a delta P, a change in pressure, that's sufficiently small that you can ignore what happens beyond that. Okay, and that will be out in the brine somewhere. And the distance that that delta P goes is very strongly influenced by the amount of leakage through the cap rock. So the reason that the cap rock turns out to be important is not because I'm particularly worried about mass transfer of salt across this particular this particular uh, uh, cap rock, it's because of the impact, in my opinion, of the pressure pulse in the injection formation and how that feeds back into your definition of area of review. And if you don't have any leakage, you will get a much different profile going outward than you will if you put leakage in. So these days we put in brine leakage through these aquitard layers or through these uh, cap rock layers, but we don't put in CO2 leakage. All right, <clears throat> what else? Well, of course, fractures and faults. Um, the world isn't perfect by any stretch. Uh, if you've got uh, a fault zone or a fracture zone, of course, you can get brine that may move up uh, the, the fractures and faults, and you can certainly get CO2 if it arrives there. And this is important and certainly needs to be considered, although I'm not going to say much more about it for the rest of this talk. All right? Because what interested me in this problem uh, is uh, ultimately illustrated on this particular global map, which is a worldwide density of oil and gas wells, taken from a special IPCC report uh, on carbon capture and storage that was published at the end of 2005. Um, but this map uh, shows uh, uh, aerial density of oil and gas wells. And what you see, especially in North America, is that along uh, largely the, the sort of uh, mid-continent deep sedimentary basins, you've got a lot of dark reds. The darkest red indicates 20,000 to 60,000 wells per 10,000. That's two to six wells per square kilometer. And the next darkest red is half a well to two wells per square kilometer, et cetera. And you see a fair amount of North America sort of has these, these, these two colors of red uh, uh, across them. The interesting observation is that these locations, the mid, the deep uh, mid-continent sedimentary basins, are exactly the locations that are most suitable for CO2 storage. So the third leakage path that becomes interesting is old wells. In North America, we've got something like seven million. Right, oil and gas wells, and most of them do their job by going through perfectly competent cap rock to get to the fluid that was otherwise trapped there, right? That's, that's where the oil and gas come from. So uh, I became interested in what we, what we could do about 
the problem of potential leakage along uh, old wells. And that led to a whole series of, of strategies that I'll explain. All right, so this became the sort of cartoon image of what we might see. We get an injection well in a sort of typical layered, you know, sedimentary uh, uh, sequence here. So we inject in some deep uh, formation. We get a pressure pulse that comes out. We get a CO2 plume that follows it. And both of these may intersect some number of existing oil or gas wells, some of which may leak. And if you get leakage along a well, what can happen? Well, here it's showing CO2 leakage. Uh, you can get leakage, and, and if you get intervening permeable layers, you can get what we'll call secondary plumes that form. All right, here's the primary plume, secondary plumes. Uh, some of this uh, leakage may wind up in drinking water zones, and some of it may ultimately wind up back into the atmosphere. And that became sort of an eh, interesting problem to think about in terms of what we're going to do about it. Uh, I had to go learn about oil and gas wells. Um, and many of you here know a lot more about wells than I do, I'm sure. But, you know, if you put a well down and you complete it, you put a casing down, there will be sections where you will put cement between the casing and the rock. Um, and <clears throat> if you abandon the well, you will typically put some <coughs> sequence of cement plugs in different vertical locations along the well. Um, <coughs> but uh, in this kind of configuration, you can think of a whole variety of small-scale pathways that could develop, that could allow one or both of these fluids to leak. All right? We've been thinking a lot about leakage outside of the casing because that, that is uh, a bit more challenging to deal with in terms of any sort of remediation. And here you can think about all sorts of small scale uh, fractures or microannuli or other sorts of things that evolve. And this problem in itself is a very interesting coupled chemistry mechanics upscaling uh, problem to think about these small scale pathways and how they evolve in, term, in terms of flow. For the purpose of this talk, I'm going to assume that all of these small-scale pathways um, can be characterized on the large scale, meaning the scale going across an entire sequence of cap rock, for example, by just the, a bulk property like an effective permeability. All right, so you have some conductance or permeability to fluid flow across a significant segment outside of casing, for example. <coughs> well. Another interesting observation, which led us, uh, in this case, uh, one of our students, Andrew Duga, to a PhD thesis, uh, is the fact that, remember I told you that the pH of uh, carbonated brine uh, will decrease. Turns out that, uh, that low pH uh, uh, aqueous phase can be quite aggressive to typical well cements. 